Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, open up with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 8 through 15 this morning. And if you don't have your own uh, Bible, your own copy of God's Word with you, you can grab the Pew Bible there in front of you and open up to page 984. 984 in the Pew Bible. And as your opening there, I want to remind you next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And so I want to encourage you to make plans to be here. Um, If you're uh, uh, a guest with us today, we'd love to have you back next Sunday. There are invitations uh, in the vestibule and in all of our different entrances and exits uh, waiting for you to take them and invite someone to church. It's not too late to put a yard sign out if you still want to do that. And remember, after next Sunday, if you want to take that yard sign and store it, it we'll use those again uh, next year as well. One uh, note for you, though, for next Sunday, I want to remind you, we will not have uh, Sunday school next week. We, we won't have Sunday school. Instead, 9.30 uh, next Sunday morning, we'll have a fellowship breakfast, a Easter brunch, so to speak. And we'll, that will be down in Fellowship Hall directly underneath here. And that's just a, a good time of fellowship and enjoying some food together. And um, then we'll be able to come up here for worship at 10.30. I, I want to also remind you, there are lots of beautiful spaces all over the church for you to grab a picture with your family. So that's another thing you can do before or after church. Cross here will be beautiful. Then we have our parlor and our prayer garden, lots of different places that are beautiful for you to take a family photo as well. So uh, we want you to take those opportunities next week uh, as we celebrate Easter together. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Uh, by the way, about family pictures, dads, you know, you can put up with it for a minute, okay? Um, And so, including myself, I'm speaking to myself as well here. You'll be okay. You'll survive the photo session. All right, brothers? And uh, um, all right. I just thought I would throw that out there for all the wives in the room. And uh, anyway, all right. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. If you have your Bibles uh, open there, why don't you stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God himself is speaking to us, beginning in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, would you please open our hearts and our minds today. God, I pray that we would receive your word. And God, I ask if we would please be changed by the power of your word today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Last year, I read a book by an author named Brian Stevenson. And... Brian Stevenson, the book he wrote is called Just Mercy. Just Mercy. It was one of the more moving and indeed gut-wrenching books that I have ever read. Uh, Stevenson tells stories in the book of the different efforts uh, that he had as a lawyer to overturn wrongful convictions. Particularly, his primary focus is for those who were sentenced to death row and whose cases didn't seem to quite 
be as locked up tight as they should be. The, the bulk of the narrative of the book, every other chapter at least, focuses on a man named Walter McMillan from Monroeville here in Alabama who spent six years on death row. Six years on death row here in Alabama for a murder it turns out he did not commit. For lots of different reasons, he was blamed for this murder and circumstantial evidence wound up putting him in jail for this murder and wound up sending him to death row for this murder. But in the end, it turned out he was acquitted after six years on death row. He did not commit the crime, never should have been put in jail in the first, in the first place. Throughout Macmillan's narrative and throughout the narrative of the whole book, you get a sense, a picture of what it feels like to be on death row. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, it doesn't feel good to be on death row. It's one of the saddest things. So, so often, um, we can tend to think about people who are in such circumstances, in jail or on death row, and our sometimes, sadly, primary reaction is, well, they deserve it. Of course they're there. They deserve it. We don't think about the fact that these, even if they do deserve it, these are people. These are human beings. They have mothers, fathers, family members, oftentimes wives and children. I was horrified, though, by the book, by how easily we can miss true justice and how easily we can carry out unjust deeds, even oftentimes in the name of of justice. Now listen, in a, in a room like this, I understand there are countless opinions on the death penalty. As a Christian, I, I believe there's a very real sense in which the death penalty can be an affirmation of human dignity. Someone takes a valuable life, therefore their life is taken from them. That's how God pronounced the death penalty. It's how we think about it. We understand that. However, no matter what your stance is on the death penalty, I think there's something we can all agree on. I think there's one thing we can all agree on when it comes to the death penalty, and it's this. There's nothing beautiful about it. You read on the practices, you think through what's happening, you hear stories from death row, and you recognize it's not worth singing about. It's not worth writing poems about it. It's not praiseworthy. I don't really like to think or talk about the fact that we live in a world even where the death penalty might be Warranted. It's sad. It's ugly. There's almost nothing uglier than the fact that there are people who must be put to death. And yet, as ugly as it is, as hard as it is to think about, as unpraiseworthy as the death penalty is, guess what? We have come here today to celebrate it. Not the death penalty as a practice, mind you, but we have come here today to celebrate a particular carrying out of the death penalty over 2,000 years ago to a man who was unjustly accused and unjustly murdered by a brutal state. We've come here today to sing about the death penalty, to ask God to keep us near the death penalty, to see it today as the greatest symbol of of the love of God and not just the death penalty our modern practices pale in comparison to what the Lord Jesus Christ experienced when he went through the gruesome public barbaric spectacle spectacle of crucifixion it was meant to be public it was meant to be something that happened in the open it was meant to be something that showed the brutality and the extreme power of the Roman Empire should anything be seen as more ugly than the cross? No. And yet, could anything be more beautiful in the eyes of a Christian than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm sure by now you've thought through the irony of the fact that we call Good Friday, Good Friday. The day that our Lord died, we call it good. And Isaac Watts seemed to grab a hold of this in his hymn writing, See from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? This morning, friends, I'm telling you that a symbol of brutal gruesomeness 
uh, a symbol that represents untold gallons of blood being spilled in human history. I'm here to tell you today that the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ makes the good news good. It's why we believe the good news is good. It's why we call Good Friday good. It's why we come here and sing about the cross. It's why we say, Jesus, keep me near the cross. It's why we say, my sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. Can you imagine a world where you would say, my glory, all the electric chair? course you can't and yet I want you to feel I want you to see how powerful this picture is how powerful this event is what it is that the Lord Jesus did for us Uh, from this passage today I want to show you three reasons why the cross of Christ makes the good news good three reasons why we're willing to write poems and sing songs about a death penalty the way we do three three reasons why the cross of Christ makes the good news good here's Point number one. First point I want you to know is this. Christ's cross brings freedom from worldly philosophies. Christ's cross brings freedom from worldly philosophies. Notice what is said in verse 8 of this passage. See to it, Paul says, that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the philosophies keep changing. (laughs) The thoughts by which the world is governed keep changing. What, What it would have meant for us to be urbane and sophisticated 20 years ago has changed significantly Today, I, I've had a hard time since I was in college keeping up with all the different worldviews and indeed philosophies that seem to be popular at any given moment. It changes frequently and it's really difficult to keep up with. I, I'll say this though, when it comes to philosophies of the world, ways of thinking that um, are sort of divorced from the scriptures at least, I, I kind of see two popular modes of thinking out in the world uh, today. And and both seem to be an effort to look for truth, an an effort to try to figure out how to make sense of the world in which we live. One is um, what we might call the search for the modern, authentic self. Carl Truman, great thinker and theologian, wrote a book a few years ago called The Rise of and triumph of the modern self, where he tried to make sense of the development of thought in the recent uh, decades here in the West. And he basically came to the idea that what we have done in the modern West is sort of tried to find the truth inside ourselves. Try to find the truth inside ourselves. That if we could come to the conclusion that we are our authentic selves, we are looking for our authentic selves, then um, we could truly be happy, we could truly express ourselves, and we could be free from all the structures and strictures that society and religion, all these different kinds of things, try to put on us. So you see that. We can see that playing itself out in all sorts of ways in our culture and society, all sorts of ways where people are looking for truth beyond what is real in front of them. So we, we, we are not bound by our world, some, some might think, some might argue. And now the interesting thing about this is we have science that allows us, we have technology that allows us to live out some of these illusions. So if you don't feel like you are in the body you're supposed to be in, there's technology and science that kind of help you adjust your body to what you feel, to what your truest, authentic self might be. If, if you don't like things in this way or that way, there are technologies that allow you to live out something other than nature or reality. And so we can see multiple, multiple scores and scores and scores of people looking for truth inside ourselves. But then there's not just modern authentic self. There's also a sort of uh, backlash to that that I'm starting to see uh, developing in the world. And this is a more what we might call Western classic 
uh, sort of approach to looking for truth. Historically, people and cultures have found truth and found meaning in who they are a part of and where they are. Um, your tribe and your place. And so often that's what we're looking for. We're looking for truth in our tribe or our place. Um, you can see very extreme versions of this in the history of the West. Maybe the most extreme version that we can think of on our minds is the sort of uh, goal of the Nazis, where they are looking exclusively at blood and soil, and they're trying to find a pure Volk to inhabit a place and then take over the world. But, but this desire to find truth there is not always extreme. Sometimes it's more basic than that. But oftentimes it's a, it's a focus on who we are, where we're from, what kind of folks we are, and where we're from. Both of these are attempts to find truth. These are philosophies, both of which boil down to human tradition. And behind human tradition, Paul tells us, this is the Bible, not me. There are elemental spirits at work. I think this is Paul referring to the devil and demons and others who are at work behind the scenes to help lead us down these paths. But it all ultimately boils down to human tradition and under that elemental spirits. And what that means is that in so many ways, our society is becoming more and more pagan. More and more pagan. Um, As Christianity declines, we become closer and closer and closer to what Paul would call elemental spirits. And also, I'll say, I don't know if you've noticed this, I've noticed that every worldly philosophy seems to be getting cultier and cultier. Has anybody noticed this? Of course, some of you are like, that's a funny thing uh, for a Southern Baptist pastor to say, to call something else culty. But all right, I I understand, okay? But here, here, let me say this. Have you noticed it more and more and more? You're either in or you're out. But more and more and more, you, you either agree totally or you're totally in disagreement. Have you noticed this? Things just start to feel a little cultier outside even far outside religion. We are all pagans and we're all fundamentalists in, in lots of ways. And, and listen, don't think for a moment that paganism, as we know it, can't become extremely fundamentalist. You see this happening all throughout the pages of Scripture and all throughout history where people are mo- moving in these directions. I say all this to say that living according to worldly philosophies is not as freeing as it seems to be. Oftentimes you'll have people say, well, I want to be my truest and most authentic self, which works really well until you tweet the wrong thing. Put the wrong thing on Facebook. Or I really want to be focused on on my people, and, and I really want to be focused on where I'm from, which really works until the world starts coming to your doorstep. And the world is at everyone's doorstep now, even if not physically, everyone uh, is impacted at some level by what it means for everyone to be online all the time. The internet has brought the world to our doorstep, whether we like it or not. But here's the reality. It's not as freeing as it seems like to live according to worldly philosophy. And so the gospel, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, brings freedom from the rat race of figuring out how to find meaning in life, what we ought to be believing, how to say or not say the right or wrong thing, all the things that we find sort of, sort of, sort of crashing in around us in the world we live in. We can find freedom from those things through the cross of Jesus. Notice what Paul says in verses 9 and 10. For in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. There is no rule, there is no authority that is over Christ. There is no spirituality, there is no God that cannot be found in Christ. All the fullness of God dwells in Christ. And so all that God was doing culminates at the cross and in the resurrection of Jesus. So we don't need to look anywhere else. That's why Paul's saying, see to it that no one takes you captive. He's not saying, hey, I want to keep a stranglehold on your faith. He's saying, don't go to those other things because Jesus is better. What you have in Christ is better. There is no spirituality you're looking for. There are no good things you're looking for that you cannot find in Christ. Instead of looking to these worldly philosophies that seem to make sense of the world, instead we look to the great 
all-encompassing mystery that does make sense of the world. All things are in Christ. He is the king of the nations. He is the ruler of heaven. He is the ruler of heaven and earth. All the spirituality we could ever want, all the blood or the soil that we could ever long for is found completely and fully in Jesus. All these little M messiahs are never going to do what we need to do. And he defeated, the Bible says here in just a few verses, these elemental spirits. He defeated, he brought them to open shame, the Bible says, through the cross. In other words, the best we can do with a worldly philosophy is follow a defeat already defeated enemy. Instead, we need to look to Jesus. He triumphs through losing, which is something no philosophy espouses and no philosophy can achieve. In other words, the gospel's good news for losers. The gospel's good news for failures. The gospel's good news for people that can't quite keep up. The gospel's good news for outcasts. And that's something no worldly philosophy has ever truly been able to accomplish. Jesus, remember, is the head of all rule and authority. Christ's cross brings freedom from worldly philosophy. Second of all, Christ's cross also brings freedom from religious rules brings freedom from religious rules maybe some of you don't feel like you're being held captive by um, modern critical theory or or something like that but maybe you do struggle maybe your primary error that you're fighting is religious rule following and for some of us we were raised even to believe that the way that we have peace with God is through obedience, through following rules. Or, or, or that if we just follow a rule or two, or a certain set of rules, that we could be right before God. I, I don't think this is how I was raised, but this feels like, I don't think my parents uh, wanted to raise me this way, but I think generally speaking for many of us, me growing up, this felt like this was sort of in the water. That This felt sort of like the understanding I had of what it meant to follow Jesus. This is what many of the religious leaders in Jesus' day had missed about the law. They thought it was a way to commend themselves before God or that it guaranteed their relationship with God rather than obedience to the law being something that happened out of faith and trust in God. And so, for example, circumcision would have been an example of probably the best example of an abuse of religious rule following. Many would have understood themselves just having been circumcised as having peace with God as an example of his covenant. It's one of the reasons why Jesus made it clear God can raise up children of Abraham out of these stones. The point is not what's happened in your body. The point is what has happened in your soul. Uh, Paul brings up circumcision here in verse 11. In him, in Christ also, you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Do you see? He's shifting the focus from what we can do with our hands to what only God can do in our hearts. And he did it by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, something that happens in the heart at conversion. He says that we've we've been buried with him in baptism. Having been circumcised in the heart, we then are baptized as a symbol of that death to self and that death with Jesus. And then he goes on to say, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Do you see this? Do you see what Paul's saying? Instead of physical circumcision, instead of just the mere following of the law, Paul here says that through Jesus we are circumcised in the heart. And I believe every word of the Bible is God's word. So you'll never hear me downplay or denigrate the law of God. It's a good thing. And yet the goal of the law was never to save us. It was never for us to to use it like a rabbit's foot. If we do this, this, and this, that means God will do this, this, and this. We are all so tempted to formulas, to to formulizing uh, faithfulness. Someone was talking to me earlier this week, and they were mentioning how odd it was that Samuel the prophet, we're in 2 Samuel now, but that Samuel the prophet had sons who didn't obey the Lord. And and he, he, he wasn't falling victim to this mindset, but many of us do when we hear things like that. 
A faithful, godly person does things God's way, and then their kids don't do exactly uh, what God would have them do? Well, friends, there's no formula for faithfulness. There is no guarantee. There are good Christian faithful parents who are doing everything right according to the Lord and their children are not following the Lord. And then there are people who are saved and become great mighty Christians in the world whose parents were pagans who never knew Jesus. There's no formula for grace. And that's part of what we need to remember when it comes to this temptation toward religious rule following. I ask you this question. Do you recognize that being buried with Jesus in baptism and being raised in His resurrection through faith gives you freedom from feeling like you have to obey God to make Him happy? Now listen, I'm very concerned with obedience to God. But it's from faith and for joy, not out of guilt and worry in order to try to earn God's love. Are you convinced that religious rule following is the way to know God? Friends, the cross tells another story. If we could do it ourselves, if we could commend ourselves before God in our own works, don't you think that God would have spared his own son the cross? Of course he would have, but instead Jesus went to the cross because we could never work our way to peace with God. Brothers and sisters, Christ's cross frees us from worldly philosophies frees us from religious rule following. And finally, Christ's cross brings freedom through peace with God. Third point, Christ's cross brings freedom through peace with God. Uh, Worldly philosophies, religious rule following, they're popular for a reason. It's because deep down inside, all of us know this, all of us know this intuitively, we can feel it from our earliest days, all of us recognize deep in our hearts that we have a problem that we need fixed. C.S. Lewis described it like a, like a hole in our hearts. St. Augustine did the same thing. He, he talked about how we are restless without God. But C.S. Lewis talked about a God-shaped hole in our hearts. We all have a problem that we need fixed. We are not at peace with our Creator. And friends, we will never know peace. Uh, we, will, we will never know meaning. We will never know joy unless we are at peace with our Creator. But because of our sin and our disobedience and God's holiness and God's justice, we have become enemies of God, the Bible tells us. We're against God in our sin. We're debtors to the Lord And so to make ourselves feel better or to try to find some level of peace or meaning or to try to reconcile ourselves to our maker, we come up with thoughts and ideas and strategies. And these play themselves out as worldly philosophies or religious rule following. But there's a problem. Even if you were to start following all the rules perfectly, you would still feel like you needed to add more rules because you still have a problem of sin in your heart. And, 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 and friends, worldly philosophies have their end as well. There's no grace there. There's no hope for those who transgress, for those who mess up. So we come up with thoughts and ideas and strategies. But friends, we can't make peace with God. It's bad news. We cannot make peace with God. But there's good news. God has made peace with us. Notice what the Bible says in verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses. We talked about this. The death a couple weeks ago. The death that sin brought in our life. We were dead in our trespasses and the uncircumcision of our flesh. Cut off from God and His promises. But then God made us alive together with Jesus. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. How did He do it? How, How does God just forgive us? He can't just say, well, sin doesn't matter if He's going to remain just. He can't do that. He he canceled the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. If you know anything about legal demands, you can't just make legal demands go away. They don't just disappear. Then he goes on. He canceled the record of debt against us. This he set aside. He canceled it? How did he cancel it? He he set it aside? How does a just and holy God set something aside? Is God just sweeping this under the rug? Is there some big cosmic rug somewhere where God hides all our sins and just nobody ever goes in the room? 
Don't ever look under there. No, no. What does the Bible say? The Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and the un circumcision of our flesh and God made us alive together by forgiving us and he forgave us how by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands he set it aside the Bible says how did he cancel it how did he set it aside he did it by nailing it to the cross what How, how did he nail these things to the cross what does that mean Does he mean this theoretically? Is this a picture of something that happened? No, friends, this is literally what happened. Paul elsewhere says this, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Do you see what Jesus has done? Do you see what happened at the cross of Jesus? Christ became your sin. He took your sin on Himself. He died the death that I deserved for my sins. He died the death that you deserved for your sins. And in so doing, what he did was allow God justly to set our record aside, to forgive us, to look past our sins, not because God can just willy-nilly abandon his own justice, but because God's justice touched down on his son on your behalf. Friends, this is the gospel. This is the beauty of the cross. This is the doctrine that we call imputation. The the sin of us was imputed to Jesus, was put on Christ in order that His righteousness might be imputed to us. And in so doing, the last verse tells us, He disarmed the rulers and authority that Satan and his demons by triumphing over them through Christ. That is, he took away the one thing the devil could ever have against you, and that's the power to accuse. He gives you peace with God through the blood of his Son. You see the beauty of this, my friends? There's nothing greater. There's nothing more important. There's nothing that matters beyond you knowing God and having a relationship with God. And God has offered that to you through the blood of his Son at the cross. Brothers and sisters, all man-made philosophies, all empty religious rule following, all those things are emptied at the cross. And the only power, the only true power we have to know God, to have fulfilling lives, to live forever with Jesus, is through His cross. Friends, there's nothing uglier. (laughs) There's nothing uglier than the death penalty. There's nothing more gruesome than the cross. And yet all of us who are on death row because of sin, awaiting judgment because of sin, can know perfect peace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ who took the punishment that we deserve. Do you see, brothers and sisters, do you see the beauty of what Jesus has done for us? Do you see how something so ugly can be so beautiful? I hope you do. I want to offer an invitation this morning. If you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus for the first time, I would love nothing more than today to get to talk to you about what it means to be a member here at First Baptist Church. It would be my joy to get that opportunity today. Uh, Second of all, you may be already be a Christian. You say, Pastor, I just need someone to talk to. I need some time to pray. That's what this time is for. You can come meet me down front, or if, if it'd be better for you, you can do business right where you are. Either way, I want to invite you to do business with the Lord. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. It'd be my joy today to talk to you about what it means to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, I'd like to invite you to come. Let's pray together.